currently hydrogen is a, a decarbonization problem, not yet a decarbonization solution. So yeah, to a certain extent, all these problems definitely have to be solved. That's an interesting thought. So we're just basically saying, take the petroleum out of the hydrogen creation market, do it in a different way, do it with renewables. Don't change the quantity, but it's basically clean it. Yeah, as a that, as that's a, an interesting thought because I, as a starting point, and I know, and people don't talk about it, do they? It's so it's so strange. It's like, yes, this is the zero reg- no. this is the zero regrets hydrogen. Um, you know, everyone's talking about <laughs> making new demand for hydrogen so that we can get this industry scaled up. Like, well, actually, what you need is to give the existing black hydrogen users a reason to choose green hydrogen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Alan Hall. I'm here with the Twitch of Turbines, the queen of composites, the doctor of blade de-icing, Dr. Rosemary Barnes. And we have a very news-packed episode this week. We're going to talk about a fish study off of the Block Island Offshore Wind Project and how all the little fishies are doing. We're going to talk about migrating birds in Europe and probably places that we don't want to install wind turbine. Rosemary is going to give us a tutorial on hydrogen electrolyzers and how we need to build a lot more than we have currently planned. Uh, We'll also look at thermal batteries, which is kind of a new technology, not so much a new technology, but there's a bunch of MIT researchers looking at uh, some really, really high temperature thermal batteries. Then at the end, we'll talk about wind turbine pricing and how wind turbine prices have collapsed over the last two years and what the effect is and, and how that affects. Steel manufacturers, which seems to be one of the main components in wind turbines today. So everyone uh, check us out on YouTube if you have a chance uh, before we get too far. And also don't forget to watch Rosie's engineering channel, Engineering with Rosie on YouTube, which is now getting close to a million subscribers. All right, first things up today, Block Island Offshore Wind Farm Study. There's been a study, Rosemary. Oh, first of all, welcome, Rosemary. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the introductions are getting more and more outrageous every week. So (laughs) thank you for that. (laughs) We have a whole team of staff working on that day and night. (laughs) So so Block Island Offshore Wind has been looking at the fishes uh, and that project got installed in 2016. There's five wind turbines. There are GE wind turbines out off the coast of Rhode Island. And they were monitoring fish before and then after the installation of the wind turbines. So, Rosemary, there was a, uh, some recent studies done, and it looks like, at least course, according to these studies, that the fish are sort of thriving there. And yeah. the, there are a couple of interesting points here is that uh, the wind turbines at Block Island, if you've seen them, they're really totally close together. They're a half mile apart. So it's close on offshore wind turbine scale. And they were trawling between the turbines. So one of the concerns was, would they snag one of the power cables when they're trawling? And I guess the answer is no. But they're they're trawling because they're trying to gather fish, and then some poor soul has to cut the fish apart and see what they've been eating. And they are eating, of all things, mussels that are growing on the wind turbine towers. Uh, on, on the underwater portions, of course, <laughs> not above water. But uh, is, does this make sense, Rosemary, in terms of uh, putting things in the water? I think Australia has known that for a long time, right, with all the coral reefs, that things in the water attract fish and, and sea life, right? Yeah, and I think, um, so the reason why I thought that this article was interesting is because, um, you know, offshore wind has been happening for decades in Europe and kind of, you know, started very gradually and now it's um, growing quite fast. But the US is only just now starting to see its, you know, first growth in offshore wind. And we have seen a lot of people and especially a lot of um, fisher people and their industry groups concerned about what the effect on um, not just the fish themselves, but the ability to, you know, run commercial fishing operations in those waters after wind farms are built. So the experience in Europe has been that, you know, it's usually quite good for the the fish at least um, because then they've got, you know, somewhere protected and like you said, you know, um, shellfish grow on any kind of structure you put underwater, even, you know, right. um, oil or, or gas rig that's out there um, will, you know, provide shelter for, for small animals and, 
medium sized animals eat the small animals and large animals eat the medium sized animals. So, you know, kind of um it helps it helps everyone moving up the food chain. So it wasn't so much a surprise, but um I think that it's good to see it in the US context at that early, early date. I mean it's a small study, mm. but you know, it's a small industry for now. And I assume that as the industry grows, there'll be some larger studies. So you kind of just gradually build up that level of confidence that you're not you know, causing some huge disruption in the um, the aquatic ecosystem. And the Mm -hmm. second part that was interesting is that they actually looked at how um, plausible plausible it is to continue commercial fishing operations in amongst the wind farm. And like you said, they showed that they're not having trouble um, keeping their, their nets away from power cables and they're able to, you know, weave within the wind turbines um, fine. So Yeah, so I think that I'm hoping that this study is going to, you know, make people feel a a little less anxious that it can be managed um, and that, you know, moving forward, everybody can get what they need out of the ocean, the the animals, the wind industry and everyone that likes to use electricity, plus everyone that, um, you know, fishes or wants to eat fish. So I I think it's promising like that and just like a really nice model to, um, you know, move, move cautiously and check your assumptions as you go um we kind of expected it wouldn't cause massive disruption for the ecosystem but you need to keep on checking that you that you weren't wrong you know to make people feel confidence in this industry and the (laughs) immense growth that we need to see from it so the one question everybody has is uh great white sharks will wind turbines attract great white sharks because (laughs) remember that the movie Jaws is based not very far from there. Is it? And in the summertime, there are massive, I mean massive, great white sharks floating around uh, the coast of Massachusetts and down there around Block Island. So will this attract bigger sharks or will the electromagnetic fields create, you know, the megalodon? <laughs> is, that, is that the inevitable response to <laughs> what's going to happen in, in the water? Because I, I, I would almost shark. bet you there is somebody out, a super shark, you know there's a Facebook page devoted to this. There has to be, right? It's going to totally be. I wouldn't to- know because totally I'm not on Facebook be. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not by choice, right? Well, well yeah, you know, yeah. you post controversial things, Rosemary, and then they have Zuckerberg got to throw you off of there. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah, my annual So moving annual on to the uh, plot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one post a year, and that's enough. Yeah. You're off the platform. Yeah. Yeah. So over over in Europe, uh, the, the researchers at the University of East Anglia, which have also been involved in climate studies too, uh, were looking at the migration of birds, and uh, I guess they put GPS locators on the birds. I'm not even sure how this happened, but they were GPS tracking uh, birds over in Europe and even Northern Africa to see where they flew, where the migration routes were. And the, the point of this, Rosemary, was to determine probably where not to put high-voltage transmission lines, probably to avoid where wind turbines would go. Uh, and they, they created these maps of where uh, migrating birds would appear. And, and the, the places are really interesting because I didn't think they made a lot of sense at first. The western Mediterranean coast of France, which uh, I've been to, really amazing place. Southern Spain, which I think you've been to, uh, the Moroccan coast, which I hear is beautiful, uh, the thing. Sinai Peninsula, <laughs> have not been there. Oh, you have? Oh, son of a gun. All right. And the Baltic coast <laughs> of Germany. Have you surfed in the Baltic coast of Germany too? It sounds no, a little cold. No, but I have, I have <laughs> surfed in Denmark. So um, <laughs> yeah, and Norway, actually. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. That's really cold. Yeah. Uh, but we, we haven't really seen a lot of studies like this. And so now, now the developers have a map of, of places to avoid and places to, to avoid putting high voltage transmission lines. It's just, it just seemed like the trend that, that we should be doing this worldwide because the wind turbines are going to be installed worldwide. Does this make sense, Rosemary? Yeah, I'm really happy to see this, this kind of, of study because, I mean, we've talked before about birds and you know, to put it in perspective about how many more birds are killed by buildings and by cars and by feral cats um, than, um, than are by wind turbines. So, you know, there's, there's that aspect of it and the engineer in me is like, you know, this is not a big problem compared to the problems that birds face by, um, you know, climate change. 
Um, but on the other hand, I also know that it's a, a problem that people care passionately about. Like I get so many comments on my channel about, about birds um, and any kind of wind turbine that says that it's safer for birds is always going to attract a lot of attention. Um, and usually those wind turbines that say that haven't actually done any kind of study to back that up. It's just, you know, they, they assume it will be better. Mm. So to me, this is by far the, the simplest solution. You know, it's not even a technology solution. It's just you find out where the birds are and especially where the birds of concern are because I don't think anybody is going to care that much if, you know, a bunch of pigeons um, get, <laughs> get killed by a uh, wind turbine. Sorry. Sorry to all the pigeon <laughs> fanciers out there, but, you know, I think we're mostly wow. worried about <laughs> about endangered birds and um and yeah migratory birds and you know they're just a really they're really cool birds um which in my opinion pigeons are not but yeah you just you find out where those <laughs> birds of interest are, are traveling and you don't put wind turbines there um you know that's the simplest solution because i mean we're certainly not at the point in the energy transition where you need to cram wind turbines into every single nook and cranny that you can find you know, we are still choosing right. appropriate locations. Um, and, yeah, we need to scale up a, a lot, but I think that will give us time to, you know, really get to understand if there are any um, good technology solutions. Like, you know, people always talk about painting a, a blade black and that helps uh, the birds to avoid the wind turbines. But even though people have been talking about that right. for at least 10 years and there haven't been any, any even medium-sized um, studies on it yet, and then the other solutions that they're using are, you know, like um, radar detection of, of birds and you know, other ways to detect when there's a, a bird flying in the area and to stop the turbines. Right. Um, so those are a bit more high tech, a bit more expensive and a bit more like, uh, you know, a, a, a fix that you can, you can make if you already installed a wind farm and it turns out to be bad for birds. But I think all developers would rather that they could run their turbines, you know, flat out and if you know time. ahead of time sure. yeah that you've got a good site that isn't going to kill any endangered birds then i think that that that's excellent so really pleased to see the study and i hope that they recreate it all around the world for all of the, the world's important birds yeah in the united states i think we have kind of a sense where migratory birds go but uh, there are some uh, I, I think migratory patterns do change don't they they're not fixed in stone I know that's one of the one of the big stories in the United States this past week was one of the developers and operators uh, pled guilty to some wind turbines uh, killing some eagle, which in the United States is a big deal. It's our national bird, right? And they were endangered. I don't think they're endangered anymore, but they were for a long time. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so the Facebook crowd then pipes up and says, you know, wind turbines are awful for the environment. Look at all these mm -hmm. birds. Somebody pled guilty to this. But what are you going to do? I mean, what are you realistic, realistically going to do if you're just in a your wind turbine has been operating there probably pretty well, and then an eagle runs into it? That's kind of what happens. And as an operator, there's really not much to do about it. There is, like you said, there really is no technology to prevent it at the moment. Yeah, or at least they're, they're complicated. I mean, there's, there is low-tech technologies like, you know, if the birds are mostly migrating in the evening um then or if you know they come down to roost in the evening so that's when they're at the you know wind turbine height then you can just say okay we switch turbines off every evening but um it's a huge huge hit to the <laughs> the bottom line of the the wind farm owner um but i sure. think where a, a wind farm is sited um poorly it turns out poorly and it does kill a, lo a lot of birds that you do need to um you know come up with something like that because People mm. care about birds, even, you know, people who aren't necessarily animal lovers, they, they do care. Sure. The last thing we want is for everyone to, you know, start hating on, on wind turbines because we need to roll, roll, <laughs> roll them out on a massive scale um, more and more every year. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's, it's super important that we keep the social license and um, do everything we can um, to prevent bird deaths. And I do see solutions too. It's not, we, we don't, wind turbines don't have to kill um, birds and they mostly don't it's only a few and so if you know just avoid the yeah. avoid putting in wind farms that are going to kill birds then that's just a win for everybody um you know the general public who loves birds plus the wind farm developers who don't want headaches with future um you know future proposals getting this huge community sure. opposition i think it's important we work on it does offshore wind help solve this problem because once you get 20 30 miles offshore are are there migratory patterns that far are far offshore i know crossing the mediterranean there are, you know, going from Africa to Spain and France. Clearly, there are patterns there, but 
And it seems like in a lot of places when you're crossing oceans that there's not a lot of migratory patterns that, or, or it's a very narrow pathway. Does offshore wind then sort of avoid a lot of this issue? I'm not sure because offshore wind is still pretty close to shores. I know um, the big first big development in Australia, Star of the South in Victoria, they've been doing a lot of um, bird studies, um, watching albatrosses, you know, because oh, okay, birds migrate from a- okay. Antarctica, maybe not in the north because I guess the North Pole doesn't have any land, so Whoa. there might not be um, a lot of flying birds up there. But right. <laughs> in Antarctica, at least, there are there are birds that, you know, go to Antarctica to hang out in the summer and then they go somewhere else in um, in the winter. So. Yeah, I, th- I think it is still important, hmm. and I know that the wind farms, offshore wind farms being developed in Australia are, are paying a lot of attention to, to the birds flying flying around the site where they want to put wind turbines. Well, I guess we just need to keep an eye on this because uh, this issue is not going to go away. And, um, you know, it, it's like you said, it's really good that there have been some studies, and there's going to be a lot more, so it can only help reduce uh, bird deaths, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, so we're going to take a short break right here, and then we'll be... Right back to talk about a number of really cool technical innovations. So stay with us. Ping Monitor is a continuous blade monitoring system which allows wind farm operators to stay ahead of maintenance. Wind techs can often hear damaged blades from the ground, but they can't continuously monitor all the turbines. They also can't calculate how bad the damage is or how fast it's propagating based on sound. But Ping can. Ping's acoustic system is being used on over 600 turbines worldwide. It allows operators to discover damage before it gets expensive and prioritize maintenance needs across their fleet. And it pays for itself the first time it identifies serious damage or saves you from doing an unnecessary visual inspection. Stop flying blind out there. Get Ping's ears on your turbines. Learn more at pingmonitor.co. Welcome back. Uh, now I want to talk about an article that I saw about electrolyzer production and the ramp up that we're going to need to make the vast number of electrolyzers needed to make all of the green hydrogen that people uh, expect that we're going to be you know, using to decarbonize all sorts of industries in the next 10 or 20 years. So the report um, said that annual manufacturing capacity needs to increase by 8,000%. Um, and that's that's a lot but you know if you look at the early early <laughs> days of wind and solar increases you know you look at the the curves that have actually happened and you will see those sorts of of numbers of um of scale up so to me that wasn't the most ridiculous thing i mean it highlights that you know this is not not a normal um you know change to make and it's not the sort of change that you would expect just from the you know 100 year old technology suddenly becoming popular um, it's definitely going to need to be driven by policy, but it also highlighted to me, sure. you know, like you you can make an electrolyzer um, and use that to split water into hydrogen and, and oxygen, but you need electricity to power those electrolyzers. So if we're going from yeah, so the current annual manufacturing capacity of electrolyzers is a little over one gigawatt, and um, by twenty thirty one, it's going to get to um, over 100 gigawatts, uh, according to these scenarios. And that means, obviously, the amount of Oof. renewable electricity that you need to power these electrolyzers is also going to increase by a lot. And I know that currently we're adding about 290 gigawatts of renewable um, electricity generation capacity every year. So if you assume that you know the capacity factors are, are roughly equal, then you know we're expecting to use half of that nearly half of that just to power electrolyzers and um you know forgetting all of the other things that we want to do with green electricity so i think that um one of my thoughts on this topic is i think that people see hydrogen as some kind of you know like silver bullet solution that's divorced from all, all the rest of the energy transition but you really do make the um you know the demand for green electricity just vastly higher um, by adding in a lot of hydrogen. So, yeah, uh, I, I think that may, maybe these scenarios will turn out to be true, but I do think we're going to end up using less hydrogen than what people are currently forecasting today. What do you think, Alan? Well, are we going to be able to reach scale with that? I, I, one of the issues with electrolyzers is they do cost money and they're, they're not free. Are, are, have we made enough of them to drive down the cost where they, at least the electrolyzers themselves are affordable? relatively affordable because you're right the electricity is one part of it but also manufacturing of the electrolyzers which i don't think there is anybody in the states even 
manufacturing them, manufacturing them in scale at the moment. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that's going to come um, regardless of whether it's a good idea. I think that it is going to come because there is so much government money that is going towards incentivizing companies to, you know, ramp up a lot. So I think that that's the scale will happen for for better or worse. But you did point, touch on a couple of interesting things that, you know, it's not just the cost of the electrolyzer, which, yeah, I can see a pathway to, you know, the, the cost coming down when we just start making, you know, so many more of them. Then there's also the cost of the electricity, which is you know a big factor in the the price of of hydrogen. And those two sure. things, the cost of the electrolyzer plus the cost of electricity, um, you know at the time that you're using it, those make up the most of the cost of hydrogen. That you know people always have these targets, two dollars a kilo or you know whatever a kilo for green hydrogen. Right. <laughs> but then the part that people forget is that you know a lot of the hydrogen plans don't involve making hydrogen right where you want to use it. They involve making hydrogen somewhere where you have really cheap electricity, um, you know, so, you know, in the Australian desert or I don't know, there's a few other sites like in Africa planned large projects there. And then you, so you make the hydrogen where you can get cheap electricity and then transport it. But the transport's never included in these, in these cost targets. And the transport is the biggest unknown currently about how we're actually going to transport it you can't just transport hydrogen gas because it you know it um takes up so much space and it it tends to leak so people are trying now liquid hydrogen which just makes it uses a lot of of energy to compress and um chill and uh you know some of it you lose through boil off and then um yeah and then people are also thinking about you know converting it into other other forms like ammonia and then converting back again into hydrogen um, after you've transported it. Ooh. All of them involve huge losses. That seems. Yeah. And it's going to be very, yeah. very ex- expensive. Um, so I think that that's to, to me, if I wanted to, you know, <laughs> roll out a huge hydrogen transition, then I would be really focused on the, the transport and storage part of the issue because that's really going to, um, you know, affect, the scale that we can reach if if we can't transport it cost effectively then it doesn't matter if we can make it cheaply if you can't make it cheaply where you need to use it so i'm surprised that we see so much emphasis on just scale 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 of electrolyzer production um and relatively few projects that are really actually transporting this stuff and there was also new information this week about you know the greenhouse warming um, potential of leaked hydrogen, which is um, apparently a lot worse than it was thought. So you know, there's there's a lot more issues to solve. Really? Yeah, rather than than just the cost of electrolyzers, which is all I see people focusing on. So we're, okay, let's back up a minute. So they're actually the what does the study say? Does it say hydrogen gets into the upper atmosphere and reflects or traps heat? Is that what the thought is? Uh, and that it reacts with um, with other greenhouse gases in the in the or you know. It has an effect on other greenhouse gases right. in the atmosphere. I haven't read the study in general. Maybe we'll put it on the on the list for, for okay. next week. But um, yeah, we can get oh into God. it. But I mean, it's really important to make sure that you understand that before you you know, like you go off on this huge um, you know program to you know decarbonize all these sorts of things, but you end up causing a, a worse greenhouse gas emissions problem. So well, yeah. How do we get down? How do we get down this far? Without knowing that, that that seems that seems a little odd, right? That's like one of the first things you would want to know is: Are we going to make a worse green? Uh, are we going to make another greenhouse gas? I don't, I don't want to put it on a scale here, but are we? We're not making a worse greenhouse gas, are we? Because if we're headed, we are headed down towards hydrogen. It's coming, it, but is it going to hurt the environment more than it's going to help? Does do we need to be electrified more? I think Musk, Elon Musk, was saying. We need to be electrified. Hydrogen is not going to be a big player here. And that may be true, but is is the rationale of that part of because of the emissions that the, the boil off and all the losses in hydrogen that yeah may contaminate the atmosphere? I, I think that the main the main oh argument is the efficiency and the um you know the scale of the amount of renewable electricity that you need to make. So you know depending on what you use hydrogen for, mm. if you're using it for anything that could be directly electrified, then you're going to need more um more renewables at the start of the day to get the same you know effect so if if you sure. want to you know power a car then you, you know one 
I don't have the figures figures here, but if you have one kilowatt hour of um, you know wind turbine electricity produced, then you get you know like maybe um, seventy or eighty percent of that back as you know as, <laughs> at the at the wheels of your car. Whereas sure. if you have to take that electricity, yeah. make um, use it to power an electrolyzer, make hydrogen, and then um, you know transport it, and then put it back in a fuel cell, or even worse, in a you know internal combustion engine, you're ending up you know, like well below 50% and more like around in the 20s and 30s, depending on the exact path that you get. So, you know, in, in most cases, you're going to pretty much triple the number of wind turbines or solar panels that you need to do something that you could have done directly with electricity. Ooh. So that's the biggest argument by far for um, directly electrifying anything that can be mm. electrified, especially when you expand to scale. I don't think there's anyone thinks that, the, um, you know, the amount that we need to scale up solar panels and wind turbines being installed like no one thinks oh we could easily triple that no no worries um you know we need to go as fast as we can and oh yeah. um you know every every problem that these technologies cause obviously they cause less if you if you put less of them up so you know birds are, are less of a problem and you know I, I don't know taking up space that could have been farmland it's less less of a problem if you have less of them so i think i think yeah. the efficiency argument is the biggest one and I mean, people have known that hydrogen is a, a greenhouse gas for a long time, but um, I, I think it didn't seem like such a big, big problem before um, when we didn't have so much of it. And now my understanding is that recent research shows right. that it's maybe even more of a, um, a greenhouse gas than we thought. And leakage is really hard. It's, it's really hard to stop it leaking. So um, and we're seeing, seeing right. that with other greenhouse gases too, like methane is leaking from stuff that much higher rates than we assumed and we can tell now from you know satellite monitoring you can you can actually measure what the leakage is and we're like oh we were were wrong about that and you know as you get that information you have to you know adjust adjust your course based on on that new information well i mean if 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 we're going down this hydrogen pathway and i I was i saw an article this week that was from siemens that was talking about building hydrogen electrolyzers over in germany and how much emphasis they're putting on trying to take the cost out of the electrolyzers mm. that that's a huge investment on their part and uh, if they're going to try to drive the cost down with in any in large industry that's the whole goal right they put all the engineers on driving the cost down and which i assume based on siemens history they will probably do that very 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 well is it just now we're going to have this subsequent problem of Hydrogen is going to be everywhere. Mm. And it, because it's the smallest, if you look at your periodic table, it's the smallest element, right? It wants to leak everywhere. It's very hard to seal up anything with hydrogen because it, it squeezes out every, in any sort of gasket or any sort of sealing method. It, it always squirts out. Mm. How, do you, how do you control that? Even at the electrolyzer scale, how would you control losses? Is that is it possible? Yeah, well, you have to remember that hydrogen is already something that we've been using for you know a really long time. It's very important in the you know manufacture of um, fertilizer, for sure. example, amongst other industrial uses. Right, and that's currently nearly all, like right. more than ninety nine percent, made from fossil fuels. So there's ninety uh, megatons right. of hydrogen demand globally um, each year currently. So. We've already got that much hydrogen and we definitely need to replace that with green, green hydrogen. So at least, okay, you know, fair. we have to massively scale up um, electrolyzer production just to meet that, you know, that existing demand for hydrogen. Because, yeah, currently hydrogen is a, a decarbonization problem, not yet a decarbonization solution. So, yeah, to a certain extent, all these problems definitely have to be solved. But, I mean, the... We already use hydrogen, so we've already got hydrogen leakage. That's something that we would need to, need mm-hmm. to fix either way. Um, yeah. Ed, but That's an interesting thought. So we're just basically saying taking the petroleum out of the hydrogen creation market. Do it in a different way. Do it with renewables. Don't change the quantity, but basically clean it. Yeah, as a that, as that's a that's an interesting thought because I as a starting point. No, I know, and people don't talk about it, do they? It's so it's so strange. It's like Yes, this is the zero. Reg- no. this is the zero regrets hydrogen. Um, you know, everyone's talking about making <laughs> new demand for hydrogen so that we can get this industry scaled up. Like, well, actually, what you need is to give the existing black hydrogen users a reason to choose green hydrogen. Um, you know, we don't we don't need to think of new things to to do with sure. it yet. You can get plenty of scale up just by replacing the you know current 
immensely polluting, <laughs> um, really high emissions hydrogen, um, you know, economy. <laughs> Re- replace the existing part with uh, with green hydrogen first, and you'll get a lot of scale up there. So one of the other energy storage methods that gets tossed around, and we're seeing more information about it uh, this week out of MIT of all places, is this thermal battery. And uh, thermal batteries are sort of news news to me in that they're essentially taking a piece of graphite and taking it to about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit or about 2,000 degrees Celsius and storing heat that way. My first thought is like, where do you put something that's 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit without burning down the neighborhood? Uh, First question. And then second question is, then they're using essentially a, a, a modified form of a solar cell. So they take this molten or this very hot block of carbon, graphite, they fill it full of a metal, it sounds like maybe tin, they, and they push tin around to heat tungsten. And then tungsten, when it gets hot, gives off radiation. And then they build a thermal solar cell <laughs> to absorb that radiation and turn heat directly into electricity as, as a lower cost storage. And the, so the, the, the news articles I've seen talk about, they could store electricity for $10 per kilowatt hour of capacity, which is about one tenth of what grid scale lithium batteries will do. Does this seem even relatively possible at scale? Where do you do this? Yeah, I mean, it's early, early technology readiness level, isn't it? This technology. Um, so definitely, yeah. I don't, I don't have any problem with the the science or the physics or the you know the thumbs that the the arithmetic that they've they've done here. Oh sure, sure. Um, but I just wonder about the timing of it um, and the actual realization of the the cost potential because you know one tenth the cost of um, lithium. Maybe they will eventually get there, but where will lithium be by the time that they they get there? Where will lithium ion batteries be by the time that you know this technology is commercialized? Right. Um. That's that's one <laughs> trick that I see. Uh, you know, clean tech startups uh, over and over again that you know that kind of it pulls the wool over potential investors' eyes. There's you know they compare their cost potential with you know their competitor now or a few years ago, um, and you know like right. So the cost of lithium-ion batteries was seeing a blip this year. It's definitely it's, it's going up right now, but I'll be incredibly surprised if the long-term trend isn't it isn't you know lower and lower and lower, similar to what the you know previous trend was. Um, sure. So you know you're not you're, you're competing with against a moving target. You, you know you don't have a, a a fixed fixed finish line to reach when you're developing a new technology. You have to worry about where your competitors will be by the time that you um you know finish your development. So that would be the, the number one um, issue that I would see. Um, and yeah, and then I wonder about the storage duration as well, because uh, most of these, you know, new exciting right. energy storage technologies I see, they're all chasing this long duration storage, which starts at about 10 hours by most people's definitions. And, you know, five years that, ago, yeah. five years ago, it didn't seem like lithium ion batteries would ever do that. They seemed like a 15 minute, one hour sort of technology. And now we just see that, right? you know, we see it pushing out and out and out. And you even see people, um, you know, bidding lithium ion batteries and winning on, on eight hour storage duration projects. They can be the cheapest now. So mm. um, I, if I had a long term duration storage technology, I would be aiming for much longer um, duration than that. And I think, you know, technologies like pumped hydro um, really cover that, you know, weeks of storage issue well. Um, thermal energy storage in terms of seasonal energy storage, just dumb storage. You heat up some water in an insulated area and leave it there for right. six months. Uh, that's very cheap right. and, <laughs> and proven. Um, and then you, uh, actually this is one area where I do think that hydrogen, if you, if you don't have, um, you know, if you need electricity uh, and you don't have a hill to put, you know, good pumped hydro on, I think hydrogen um, can actually, you know, play that role of, a large amount of storage that you're going to need, you know, every, every few years you'll need a, you know, a few weeks of storage. Sure. Um, yeah. So I think those are the, the traps that a technology like this um, could fall into 
is failing to see their path ahead really you know like people consider their com- competitors right. too narrowly they fail to consider how competitors are changing um it's just such a such a dynamic system the energy transition it's it's never you know every technology can't just stay in its lane and focus on you know the competitors either side you also have to watch you know the next field over what's what's the race happening over there and are they going to end up on our racetrack at, at yeah. the end of the <laughs> at the end of the day and yeah it's exciting but it's complicated well i think uh, elon musk s- sorted this out recently in the uh, latest uh, ted talk and in, in which he, he said coming up with ideas is really easy putting them into practice is really hard there has been like a thousand electric car companies over the last couple of years and all have failed except for one so just getting from the laboratory to something that's real and then manufacturing is so impossibly difficult yeah i think it's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of vc capital going into these kind of projects at the moment because they realize they've watched the spacex tesla situation and how rare that is and when you're talking about something as complicated as 5,000 degrees of carbon graphite block with liquid metal, you just say problem, 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 10 year, 20 year sort of lifetime. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it doesn't make sense to invest in it. So we'll see how this goes. I want to keep an eye on the technology, but again, it's just such a hard thing to do. So I think that venture capital could do, could do a lot better. I think that they haven't quite yet moved enough away from, you know, their, their investment model, which worked really well for, you know, software and and apps and that sort of thing. Uh, I don't think it's quite tweaked to them yet that, you know, a lot of these engineering risks might seem like total unknowns to them now, but, you know, when they start to (laughs) get, get more smart engineers involved on the team and, you know, you can, you can manage these, these risks and you, you can foresee the future and you can also, you know, make sure that you test your, the, the biggest, most important commercial risks. If it's related to an engineering problem, you can make sure that you test that first. Cause you see a lot of times, you know, these companies kind of string along, along, along. And then after 10 years, you realize, oh, you know, that they could never yeah. have worked because of something we could have tested in year one. Um, so yeah, I, I think that we will see that investment environment get more sophisticated as you know we all learn all learn to play together better the engineers and the financial analysts all, all getting along <laughs> yeah well, that's that's yet to be seen I, i'm not so sure that's going to happen but you know uh you, you don't have elon musk walking around the street very often so you don't need some really really smart people not say there's not smart people but you can be smart Sort of book smart, you can be manufacturing smart. You need someone that can cross that barrier, and those people are very hard to find. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back from the break, we're going to be talking about the the prices of wind turbines and how they have plummeted, and how wind turbine OEMs are really starting to complain about it. So we'll be right back after this. All right, welcome back to the Uptime Podcast. Uh, we have a really interesting segment here about the pricing of wind terms. I know that's one of the things on our website, the weatherguardwind.com, shameless plug, that uh, we have an article about the, the, the price of wind energy. How much does it cost? And it, it, everybody wants to know. And it, it, it's one of those things that you don't see pop up very often because no one wants to talk about it. But in this pricing environment that we're in, we see a lot of OEMs talking about it, and in particular, Goldwyn, which is a huge wind turbine manufacturer. Uh, they have seen prices in China go from seven hundred thousand dollars per megawatt in early twenty twenty to about three hundred and seventy thousand dollars per megawatt. That's roughly half. So they've seen the prices they can get for those wind turbines drop in half over the last roughly year and a half to two years. And what the chairman of Gold Goldwyn is saying at the moment is that instead of pushing for lower prices, the developers need to shift their focus onto the quality and the long-term performance of the wind turbines, which is not where a lot of operators are at at the moment. And it, that same complaint that Goldwyn has is also being mirrored uh, at GE. And one of the executives at GE Energy, Renewable Energy, uh, in fact, their, their CEO, Sherry Hitchcock, was at uh, Bilbao at the wind conference in Bilbao uh, a few weeks ago. And what she's saying is, hey, the prices are crazy and the supply chain is in chaos at the moment. In fact, the the quote is, the state of the supply chain is ultimately unhealthy right now. 
it is unhealthy because we have inflation or an inflationary market that is beyond what anybody anticipated even last year. Steel is going up three times. So obviously <laughs> the price of steel is a big driver because the towers are made out of steel. And GE is cer certainly con concerned about that. Uh, they're saying that the price of steel is over $2,000 per ton, which it is, that is expensive based on historical norms. And pretty much any other metal at the same time is going up, including copper. Uh, uh, Ms. Hickok went on to say that the GE team is very fearful of the entire wind industry ecosystem, which I think is a very good input, by the way. Uh, quote, is, it is ridiculous to think how we can sustain a supply chain in a growing industry with these kind of pressures. Right now, different suppliers within our industry are reducing their footprint. They are reducing jobs in Europe. Now, I, I think that's really important to mention because what you're seeing is offshoring and a time when everybody's trying to onshore, <laughs> wind is still offshoring a great deal of it. And the, another quote here is, uh, if the government thinks that on a dime, the supply chain is going to be able to turn around and to meet two or three times the demand, it is not reasonable. So what the industry is saying to national governments is that the supply chain is a mess. And if we can't get inflationary prices stabilized, and in particular steel prices down, we're never going to meet our renewable energy goals. And, and Rosemary, I mean, having worked at one of the larger OEMs, uh, pricing pressure is huge, right? There's not, there's not much margin in wind turbines. Yeah, right? the price pressure is Price pressure is immense, and you know, still pressure for the price of wind turbines keep coming down. You know, if you want to win new projects, because there's you know such an a competitive environment, prices are st still being forced down while costs are going up uh, immensely. So you mentioned steel; that's um, you know, that's a, a major thing for all um, wind turbines. And then if we think offshore specifically, they need so much copper because you know you've got to add a, um, a power cable. Um, you know, to take the take it to shore. Um, right. So that's probably even more significant for offshore is the the price of of copper. And yeah, it's really it feels like it's become like a, a commodity. You know, where you're just all competing on on price and and that's it. But you know, you forget that these are <laughs> a yeah. huge, complicated machines, and you need them to be reliable. So you know, you can win a battle of you know. Um, winning new new projects for a lower and lower price you can win them by you know cutting your engineering hours that you spend on each project and um you know like scrimping on on quality basically but it, it, most major manufacturers have seen you know at some point in their their history over the past decades when you have a short term strategy like that works really well for 5 or 10 years and then you start seeing um you know huge costs yep. from um warranty <laughs> claims um, not to mention that, you know, like how bad it makes the industry look when, um, you know, you start to see failures of these, you know, huge, <laughs> dangerous machines. Um, yeah, I mean, they're dangerous if they start failing. So I, I think that it is pretty short-sighted sure. for the industry as a whole, but, you know, no one company controls the industry as a whole. You can only control your own company. And if you can't get any sales because everyone else is playing the the game of, um, you know, of just <laughs> lowering and lowering and lowering prices, then you're going to go out of business, even if you know your competitors probably will too in five or 10 years, you know, you kind of have to play the same game that everyone else is. So I do think that it's worth worthwhile thinking, sure. you know, for, for countries and regions to think strategically about where they, you know, want to get all of their <laughs> renewable energy from in the future and um, whether it's okay that, you know, it's all, all has to be made offshore and um, in cheaper, cheaper locations and that, you know, it has to be done on less and less and less engineering hours. You know, is that what we want? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and you're mirroring what the Nordex chief executive, uh, Jose Luis Blanco, just recently said. Uh, he, he, he's quoted as saying, we are still selling at a loss because of the dynamics of auctions and the low predictability of volumes. Uh he says, we are investing in volumes and trust in market dynamics. Then the volume doesn't come. Then a factory is empty. And then it is better to have some cash flow than no cash flow. No cash flow. And consequently, the sector enters a self-destructive loop. You can see that dynamic playing out right now. It's about keeping cash in to, to pay your bills that are 
piling up. You just need the cash flow. Even if you're losing a little bit of money, it's better to have some cash flow instead of no cash flow. So you're willing to eat a little bit of loss. And and uh, he, he goes on to say, interestingly, currently eight, some 85% of the industry's components, wind turbines, are are coming from China. Mm. That's a lot. And if if they want to change that, Europe's going to have to really change the way it does some of its uh, laws and and who they're going to support essentially and that that's a that's a be a massive shift if the industry goes from 80 to 90 percent Chinese Chinese components components made in China to Europe based I don't I don't know sure if they flip the switch on that they could pull that off today because they just don't have the infrastructure so how does this play out I mean, how do how do you're talking about the CEOs of these large wind turbine OEMs saying we're in trouble and and yet it doesn't look like anybody from Europe and the EU and the United States obviously is sort of like uh, oh well I, I don't know how this comes to a yeah, successful I think it, end I think it does need you? to involve um, some governments or group, groups um, groups of governments to step in and we have seen that you know like the US has all these plans to onshore um, critical mineral um, uh, supply chain and battery supply chain and um, all those sorts of things and if people if countries consider that renewable energy is critical um, that they have you know a certain amount that they want to be able to install in 10 years and in 20 years then I think that they need to think strategically about it and with some of these large projects you know you don't have to take the lowest cost you don't have to have a reverse auction you can choose based on other other criteria right. And um, yeah, I just can't see how the current system does actually allow for that like long-term strategic uh, <laughs> plan to make sure that you do have um, options available in ten or twenty years. Because I mean, you don't want to end up with with one wind turbine company left at the at you know the end of the decade. Um, that, that's not going to cause oh, yeah. um, cheap cheap prices or you know um, the scale that we need to to roll no. it out. Um, it, that would be bad for, for the planet, really. Um, not to mention every country that um, wants to keep taking advantage of, of cheap renewables. So uh, I think something needs to change. Well, well yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that. And it's weirdly enough, the uh, United States, being a fairly large country, has not have the uh, intestinal fortitude or the will or the people. I'm not sure which what it is to look at this problem and take it on. And when there has been some attempts to sort of um, stabilize like steel prices and the steel industry, it, it's just really chaotic. It changes so often and there's no long-term pathway here. And you can understand how China is and the Chinese government is playing a long-term game and Europe and the United States are playing a very short-term game. And that long-term game in some of these heavy industries is really starting to pay off for China, obviously, if they're 85% of the content of a wind turbine, that's that's a that's a really big deal. It's going to be, take a long time to recover that. So, it, it, is is there uh, with the current economic conditions a chance for change? Is that really possible? Even like this year, like I think it's a this year problem. It's not a 2025 problem. It's a 2022 problem. Is it? resolvable in 2022 can we get a better pathway going we could i don't know if i think we will i think it's going to take a few years longer but i do see the right sorts mm. of changes happening in in other okay. um in other industries uh so I, I think we will get there a little bit later than we should that's that's my prediction for the future well i i in the u.s we just well we i say we uh the, the administration is is basically uh putting some restrictions on where you can buy steel from on federal projects so they're going to try to force it to be purchased in the united states i don't think that helps wind turbines i don't think it really helps ge and any of the manufacturers siemens any of the manufacturers that are making things in the united states i don't think it really helps them at all it helps the federal projects maybe but it doesn't there's no subsequent benefit right there's there's no trickle down effect i'll throw that out there. there's no trickle down effect in steel it doesn't appear to be so I'm, I'm just not sure where this goes and i would be really interested to talk to some of the analysts in steel to, to see what their thoughts were and what could be done because you're not making wind turbines without a lot of steel. And, and that's unfortunate. So uh, that's going to wrap up our program for this week. Hey, uh, check us out on Stitcher, Spotify, uh, and on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. 
And while you're there, subscribe to Rosemary's Engineering with Rose, Rosie YouTube channel because it is a fabulous place and check out her live streams. Uh, it, it, there's great information there. So uh, that's it for this week. We'll see you next week on the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast.